Sherry Ann Jarvis, a tragic figure from Forest Lake, Minnesota, became a victim of murder. Her lifeless form discovered in Huntsville, Texas, on the fateful day of November 1, 1980. The grim discovery occurred mere hours after her brutal assault and murder, and her identity remained a mystery for an astonishing 41 years, until forensic genealogy finally unveiled her name in November 2021. On that somber morning, a truck driver traversing the Sam Houston National Forest stumbled upon the nude body of a young girl, estimated to be between 14 and 18 years of age. She lay face down in a patch of grass, approximately 20 feet from the edge of Interstate Highway 45, just two miles north of Huntsville. The motorist promptly alerted the authorities at 9.20 a.m., reporting his harrowing find. It was determined that she had been deceased for roughly six hours, placing her time of death around 3.20 a.m. Around her neck, a delicate rectangular brown pendant, featuring a smoky blue or brown glass stone on a slender gold chain, was discovered. While her ears were pierced, no earrings adorned them, nor were any found at the scene. Investigators also recovered high-heeled red leather sandals with light brown straps, which were identified as belonging to the girl while she was alive. Notably, the rest of her clothing was missing. The young woman stood approximately 5 feet 6 inches tall and weighed between 105 and 120 pounds, described by the Harris County Medical Examiner as well-nourished. Her hazel eyes and light brown hair, about 10 inches long with a hint of reddish tint, bore no signs of color treatment. Her fingernails were unpolished while her toenails were adorned with a soft pink hue. Her body bore unique characteristics, including a vertical scar of one and a half inches at the edge of her right eyebrow and an inverted right nipple. The overall condition of the deceased, reflecting her health, nutrition, and the exceptional dental care she had received throughout her life, suggested she hailed from a middle-class background. The coroner determined the cause of death to be asphyxia resulting from ligature strangulation, likely executed with pantyhose, remnants of which, along with her underwear, were discovered within her vaginal cavity. This act appeared to be an attempt to stanch any bleeding during her transport to the location where she was ultimately found. Before her demise, she had suffered a sexual assault involving a large blunt object, both vaginally and anal. However, it remains uncertain whether she experienced conventional rape, as no biological evidence supporting such an assault was located at the crime scene or during the coroner's examination. Additionally, the girl had endured severe physical abuse, evidenced by numerous bruises across her body, particularly around her swollen lips and right eyelid. A deep bite mark was also visible on her right shoulder. Following extensive appeals to witnesses and widespread media coverage of this tragic murder, several individuals, now all deceased, reported having seen a teenage girl resembling the victim within the 24 hours leading up to her death. Among them were the manager of a South End Gulf station and two employees at the Hitchin Post truck stop, who described her attire as blue jeans, a soiled yellow pullover, and a white knit sweater with notably large pockets that extended beyond her waist. She was also seen carrying red leather-strapped high-heeled sandals. At approximately 6.30 p.m. on October 31st, a witness reported seeing a girl, somewhat disheveled in appearance, arrive at the South End Gulf Station. She emerged from a blue Chevrolet Caprice, dating back to either 1973 or 1974, which was driven by a Caucasian male. The girl inquired about directions to the Texas Department of Corrections Ellis Prison Farm, after receiving the necessary guidance, she departed the station on foot and was subsequently spotted walking north along Sam Houston Avenue. Later, she was seen at the Hitchin Post truck stop adjacent to Interstate 45, where she once again sought directions to the prison farm, mentioning that a friend awaited her there. A waitress, sensing something amiss, provided her with a map detailing the route. 
During their brief exchange, the girl claimed to hail from either Rockport or Aransas Pass, Texas, and asserted that she was 19 years old. When the waitress expressed skepticism about her age and inquired if her parents were aware of her whereabouts, the girl dismissively replied, Who cares? In the aftermath, both inmates and staff at the Ellis Prison Farm were shown mortuary photographs of the victim, yet none could identify her. A detective revisiting the cold case in the 21st century noted that only one inmate matched the victim's age, but no connection was ever established between them. Investigators ventured to the Rockport and Aransas Pass areas to collaborate with local law enforcement on any reports of missing females fitting the victim's description. Additionally, school officials in both districts were contacted for further inquiries. A thorough examination of numerous Texas high school yearbooks was conducted in search of any young woman reported missing whose physical characteristics aligned with those of the victim. Unfortunately, these efforts yielded no results, and at that time no missing person reports concerning young Caucasian females matched the victim's profile. Despite extensive appeals from law enforcement and media in the towns of Rockport and Aransas Pass, to uncover the victim's identity, no promising leads emerged. It was speculated that she might have originated from the area, as she had mentioned to a waitress at the Hitchin Post truck stop the evening before her tragic demise. On January 16, 1981, the unidentified girl was laid to rest in the Adikes edition of Oakwood Cemetery, following an open casket funeral. This cemetery is situated in the very city where her remains were discovered. She rests beneath a tombstone generously donated by Morris Memorials, inscribed with the words, Unknown White Female, died November 1, 1980. Subsequently, a new tombstone was erected, featuring her name, nickname, photograph, and the heartfelt inscription, Never Alone and Loved by Many. In 1999, the remains of Walker County Jane Doe were exhumed for a more detailed forensic examination, which included obtaining a DNA sample. This second analysis adjusted the estimated age of Walker County Jane Doe to between 14 and 18 years, with investigators suggesting that her most probable age was between 14 and a half and 16 years. In November 2015, the Walker County Sheriff's Office officially reopened the case. DNA testing was also performed on the high-heeled red leather sandals discovered at the crime scene, although the results of this testing remain confidential. Local police departments continued to diligently monitor other missing person reports for any potential connections to the victim. Investigators have sought the assistance of the public through a multitude of online platforms, news outlets, and television channels, all in a bid to uncover new leads. In the case yet, regrettably, these efforts have not yielded any breakthroughs in identifying her murderers. Several forensic facial reconstructions have been meticulously crafted to provide insights into the appearance of Walker County Jane Doe during her lifetime. In 1990, renowned forensic and portrait artist Karen T. Taylor produced a post-mortem drawing that included an estimation of the necklace she was wearing at the time of her death. Additionally, an investigator from the Walker County Sheriff's Office has contributed a facial rendering of the victim. Taylor has featured this poignant case in her esteemed book, Forensic Art and Illustration where she candidly shared the challenges she faced in creating her sketch, as the only frontal image available was taken after the victim underwent significant reconstructive cosmetic procedures at the Huntsville Funeral Home, intended to render her features suitable for an open casket viewing. Taylor further noted that she did not have access to a scaled photograph of the necklace, compelling her to make an educated guess regarding its size for the reconstruction. In the decade leading up to the identification of Walker County Jane Doe, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children developed and disseminated two facial reconstructions depicting how the victim might have looked in life. The first of these reconstructions was unveiled in 2012 
followed by the second shortly after the 35th anniversary of her tragic murder. Each reconstruction was meticulously crafted using mortuary photographs of the victim as a reference. In 2020, the Walker County Sheriff's Office collaborated with Othram Incorporated, embarking on a quest to identify Walker County Jane Doe through the innovative approach of genetic genealogy. In the early endeavors to retrieve viable genetic material from her remains, the efforts proved fruitless. However, subsequent analyses of her preserved tissue samples successfully yielded usable DNA, which facilitated the creation of a genetic profile for the victim and the construction of a family tree. This genealogical mapping enabled the identification and location of living relatives. DNA samples collected from these individuals were instrumental in confirming the identity of Walker County Jane Doe in 2021. On November 9, 2021, the Walker County Sheriff's Office publicly revealed that Walker County Jane Doe was, in fact, 14-year-old Sherry Ann Jarvis, who had vanished from Stillwater, Minnesota in 1980. Earlier in late September 2021, forensic artist Carl Koppelman had announced her identification, having crafted several forensic reconstructions of the victim while temporarily withholding her name to allow her family the necessary time to mourn privately. Known affectionately as Tati among her friends, Jarvis had been taken from her home and placed under state custody at the age of 13 due to chronic truancy, subsequently running away shortly after her 14th birthday. Her last communication with her family was a letter addressed to her mother from Denver in August 1980, in which she expressed her frustration with being in state custody, but conveyed her intention to return home eventually. During the formal announcement, a heartfelt statement from her family was read, expressing their profound gratitude for the unwavering dedication of all those involved in identifying Jarvis and providing the long-awaited, albeit painful answers, regarding her fate. They found solace in her identification and extended their thanks to those who had visited her grave during her period of anonymity, emphasizing their desire for justice against her murderers. Daniel James Morcombe, 19th December 1989, 7th December 2003, was a young Australian boy whose life was tragically cut short when he was abducted from the picturesque Sunshine Coast in Queensland on 7th December 2003, at the tender age of 13. On that fateful Sunday, Morcombe was last seen at an unofficial bus stop beneath the Keel Mountain Road overpass in the Woomby area, approximately 2 kilometers, 1.2 miles, north of the iconic Big Pineapple. Witnesses noted his presence around 2.10 p.m. as he awaited a bus to the Sunshine Plaza shopping center, where he intended to get a haircut and purchase Christmas gifts. Unfortunately, the bus he planned to take at 1.35 p.m. had broken down, and when a replacement bus finally arrived, it failed to stop due to its unofficial status and being behind schedule. The driver, aware of Morcombe's plight, radioed for another bus to assist him. Eyewitnesses later recounted seeing two men in proximity to Morcombe. However, when the second bus arrived just three minutes later, both Morcombe and the men had vanished. His disappearance became one of the most thoroughly investigated cases in Queensland's history. By the 12th of December 2008, a substantial reward of 250,000 Australian dollars from the government, alongside 750,000 Australian dollars from private donations, had been offered for information leading to his whereabouts. The private reward lapsed at midnight on 31st May 2009, coinciding with reports from the Seven Network that a known pedophile, Douglas Jackway, might be of interest to law enforcement. Jackway had been released from prison merely a month before Morcombe's abduction, leading to significant criticism of the Queensland government regarding his release. 
Independent MP Peter Wellington highlighted the Supreme Court's clear evidence of Jack Way's potential for reoffending. This situation ignited calls from civil liberties groups for legislation to prevent media outlets from naming individuals associated with criminal investigations. Earlier that month, a life-sized clay model of the suspected abductor was placed at the site of Morcombe's disappearance, resulting in over 300 tips being received within days. In July 2009, the parents of Morcombe sought a coronial inquest regarding their son's mysterious disappearance. They were particularly focused on several individuals with criminal backgrounds who had claimed to possess knowledge about the circumstances surrounding Morcombe's death. The inquest took place from October 2010 to April 2011, during which key witnesses were summoned, including the bus driver who neglected to stop for Morcombe at the overpass a woman who had observed a man lingering nearby, and various persons of interest. On the 13th of August 2011, following an extensive undercover operation known as Mr. Big, authorities apprehended Brett Peter Cowan, charging him with multiple offenses, including Morcombe's murder, child stealing, deprivation of liberty, and the indecent treatment of a child under 16, after he led detectives to the location of Morcombe's remains. In 2006, Cowan had been questioned about the case and disclosed to police that he had traveled along Keel Mountain Road to procure marijuana on the day Morcombe vanished. He confessed to having encountered Morcombe and offered him a ride to the shopping center, having parked his vehicle in a nearby church parking lot. During this period, a white Mitsubishi Pajero was confiscated from a property on Russell Island, as it was suspected to be linked to Morcombe's abduction. A witness at the coronial inquest had reported seeing a vehicle matching that description, parked just 100 meters north of the location where Morcombe was last seen. On 21st August 2011, a search at Glass House Mountains yielded two shoes and three human bones with the footwear resembling those Morcombe wore at the time of his disappearance. Additionally, underpants and a belt were discovered. However, a distinctive fob-style pocket watch engraved with Dan, which belonged to Morcombe, remains missing. Ultimately, the investigation uncovered a total of 17 bones, including a rib, hip, leg, arm, and vertebrae. The identification of the remains as belonging to Morcombe was confirmed through DNA analysis derived from his toothbrush. Consequently, a funeral service was held in his honor at Siena Catholic College on December 7, 2012, attended by over 2,000 mourners. On February 7, 2014, Cowan was summoned to face trial, facing charges of murder, indecent treatment of a child under 16, and improper handling of a corpse. The proceedings commenced at the Supreme Court of Queensland on February 10, 2014, presided over by Justice Roslyn Atkinson. The prosecution concluded its case on March 7, having presented testimony from 116 witnesses and submitted more than 200 pieces of evidence. Cowan maintained his innocence and chose not to testify. On March 13, 2014, Cowan was convicted on all counts. He had a history of two prior convictions related to child sexual offenses. The following day, he received a life sentence with the possibility of parole after 20 years, alongside an additional three and a half years for the indecent treatment of Morcombe and two years for the improper handling of his remains, all to be served concurrently. Justice Atkinson remarked, I don't believe you should be released in 20 years. Cowan subsequently appealed his sentence to the Queensland Court of Appeal, led by Justice Margaret McMurdo, arguing that his confession obtained through an undercover police operation should not have been admissible. On May 21, 2015, his appeal was rejected. Additionally, former Queensland Attorney General Jared Blagy sought to increase Cowan's minimum sentence, which was also dismissed.
In response to their tragic loss, the Morcombe family established the Daniel Morcombe Foundation, dedicating their efforts to keeping the memory of Morcombe alive and raising awareness about child safety and the threats posed by predatory criminals across Australia. The Australian media plays a pivotal role in championing these initiatives, particularly during the annual commemoration of Morcombe's disappearance. Each year, a Day for Daniel is observed, dedicated to raising awareness about the fragility of childhood. Complementing this significant occasion is the Ride for Daniel, a prestigious event that traverses 50 kilometers along the stunning Sunshine Coast, a tradition that has been upheld since 2005. On September 13, 1991, a farmer stumbled upon the lifeless body of an unidentified woman in a cornfield located in Mission Township, near Norway, within LaSalle County. She lay concealed beneath a curtain adorned with hooks, dressed in a striped men's dress shirt and black spandex trousers, devoid of shoes or personal belongings. Her physique revealed extensive dental work, breast implants, and two tattoos. The medical examination suggested probable cocaine intoxication as the cause of death, yet the manner remained undetermined. She was subsequently laid to rest in Oakwood Memorial Park, her headstone bearing the poignant inscription, Somebody's Daughter, Somebody's Friend. This enigmatic case has traversed the tenures of three sheriffs, Anthony Condy, Tom Templeton, and Adam Dis and four coroners, Marion Osborne, Jody Bernard, William Wujek, and Rich Plock, each dedicating relentless efforts over more than 30 years alongside their devoted teams. Numerous leads were meticulously pursued, and flyers were disseminated across the United States and Canada in a quest to unveil the identity of the unknown Jane Doe. However, as the years passed, the investigation grew cold. In the early 1990s, forensic science lacked the advanced technologies we possess today. Investigators relied on traditional fingerprinting and dental record examinations, but the absence of a name or background severely limited their options. The LaSalle County Coroner's Office and local law enforcement diligently followed leads and garnered some media attention, yet substantial breakthroughs remained elusive. In the absence of DNA testing, cases of this nature often hinged on witness accounts or discernible clues on the body. Regrettably, no witnesses emerged, and no definitive signs surfaced to clarify her identity or the circumstances surrounding her demise. In 2013, her remains were exhumed to facilitate DNA analysis and to reassess the findings of the case, employing a range of innovative investigative techniques in the hope of finally uncovering her identity. In this era, investigative agencies had commenced the utilization of DNA technology to construct profiles for unidentified victims, albeit the capabilities were still in their infancy. A series of advanced techniques, including facial reconstruction modeling, age regression, radiocarbon dating, and isotopic diet analysis, were employed on her skeletal remains. While these methodologies yielded valuable insights regarding Jane Doe, they ultimately fell short of revealing her identity, leaving the case once again in a state of stagnation. In 2019, Dr. Matthew Joel, a distinguished professor at Illinois Valley Community College, graciously offered his expertise to assist with the investigation. The innovative approach of investigative genetic genealogy was adopted by the college, aiming to uncover a living relative. Remarkably, this endeavor generated a list of potential matches, which was subsequently forwarded to the coroner's office for meticulous examination. The list was extensive, necessitating countless hours of diligent investigative work to refine it to the most plausible candidates. This research led to the emergence of numerous new leads. In February 2024, the Sheriff and Coroner's Office received the encouraging news that the FBI had agreed to extend their investigative support for the Jane Doe case.
By July, a potential living relative was identified and later confirmed. Today, we are pleased to announce that Jane Doe has been identified as Paula Ann Lundgren. Born in 1962 and primarily residing in the Chicago land area, she was 29 years old at the time her remains were discovered. With her identity now established, the sheriff's office is optimistic that fresh leads will emerge regarding the circumstances surrounding her presence in the cornfield on September 13, 1991, and the individual responsible for her placement there. Coroner Rich Plock and Sheriff Adam Diss extend their heartfelt gratitude to all agencies, investigators, family members, friends, former sheriffs and coroners, and the public who contributed to the resolution of this case. After 33 long years, Jane Doe finally has a name, Paula Ann Lundgren.